What is communication? We're going to give our best effort to answer that. So we have to admit that defining communication in a way that everybody agrees with is almost impossible. Why? Well, one reason is because the word is so common. In 1970, in the Journal of Communication, Frank Dance said that communication is one of the most overworked terms in the English language. And he wrote that decades ago, but the situation is really the same today. It's a word like culture or community. If you asked a hundred different people what those words mean, you'd get a hundred different definitions. But we have to try to define it. I'm no quitter. So here's what we're going to do. This video has three parts. First, I'm going to give you a basic definition. Next, we'll look at three popular models of communication over time. And finally, I'll touch on how different researchers study communication from different angles. Taken together, that will give you a well-rounded answer to this question. The word communication in Latin comes from communicare, which means to share, to make something common. And I love that. My plain language, basic working definition of communication from all I've read is the process by which people transmit information, share verbal and nonverbal messages, and create meaning with each other. So let's look at three popular communication models that align with those three key words, transmit, share, and create. First, some people think communication is about how we transmit information. Years ago, in 1948, Claude Shannon and Warren Weaver developed a foundational model of communication that you'll see in most textbooks. From their view, communication happens when an information source, a sender, has a message and transmits that message in the form of a signal through a channel. Let's say that little box in the middle represents the channel. Then that signal is received by the receiver at its final destination. Along the way, there might be some noise in the communication system that could negatively influence the process. Some people call this the container model because according to the model, meaning is contained in the words themselves. When the message has then reached its final destination, communication has been accomplished because the message has been sent and received. Now, I'd like to point out that the concept of feedback is not part of Shannon and Weaver's original model, even though some textbooks add that. The word feedback does not appear in the diagram and nowhere in the text of the original article. That concept came later. Shannon and Weaver were diagramming and were interested in communication systems like the telegraph, the telephone, and radio. And their model reflects that 1948 way of looking at communication. So it's a linear one-way model that describes how information is transmitted. Their model is very limited and not designed to explain face-to-face -face communication. And that's why most textbooks call this the information transfer model. So that's our first keyword, transmit. To some people, the answer to the question, what is communication, is that it is simply the transmitting of information. Our next keyword is share. Some people think communication is about sharing meaning. Fast forward several decades and a couple of models to 1962, Dean Barnlund articulated the transactional model of communication. To Barnlund, communication wasn't a one-way process. To him, it had a different nature. Communication was dynamic, continuous, and circular. In other words, communication between people is an ongoing, back and forth, simultaneous exchange. We are senders and receivers at the same time. And the point is we exchange messages because we want to share meaning with other people. Barnlund's model includes both verbal and nonverbal cues and feedback. And importantly to Barnlund, meaning existed within the person, not the words. So like Shannon and Weaver's 1948 model, the sender has a meaning that he or she, she wants to communicate and encodes it in specific words and then sends it. And at that point, according to Shannon and Weaver's model, meaning exists in the words. But for Barnlund, that wasn't quite right. 
his transactional model says that the receiver interprets or decodes what those words mean for him or herself, then that really highlights that meaning is not in the words, but meaning is in us. It's in our minds. We supply the meaning. We are superimposing our understanding or interpretation onto the process. And that's why two people can hear the same exact message, but interpret it differently. So to Barnlund, he looked so closely at the way communication happens face to face, and he looked at some of these subtle processes that were happening to explain this process more thoroughly. So while Shannon and Weaver's model is about transmitting messages, the transactional model describes the complex and layered process we follow to pursue and achieve shared meaning with each other. To Barnlund, it's all about the way individuals collaboratively work toward shared meaning through communication. So Barnlund's answer to the question about what is communication is it's the process through which we achieve shared meaning. Our next keyword is create. So let's leap forward a couple of more decades and talk about how communication is the generative process that creates our social world. And to me, this is where it gets really interesting. According to this approach, the word communication describes the way we create meaning in the first place. Robert Craig says communication constitutes our social reality. Constitute means create. He said in his 1999 article, communication is not a secondary phenomenon. Communication doesn't happen after those views are already in our head, after culture has taught us norms, after socioeconomic factors have shaped us. Craig says that communication is the primary constitutive social process that explains all these other factors. So I'll put that in my own words. Compared to the previous mentioned models, pre-existing meaning is not in the words. Meaning is not even in our minds that we then communicate. We're not simply sharing already existing ideas. When we communicate with each other, according to this view, in our conversations, we are generating those ideas together. We create meaning through our interactions with others over time. We create our social world together that we could have not created on our own. The creation of shared meaning is a collective accomplishment. Our whole social reality is the product, the outcome of communication. So communication is that driving creative force at the center of our sense of self, our relationships, our families, our culture. Through interactions, we make or break agreements. We create or dissolve relationships. We form the tone or nature of those relationships. We establish societal norms or violate them through the process of communication. So it might seem on the surface that meaning exists in words or even in our heads, but to Robert Craig and others who follow this constitutive approach, we have to remember that we are not dealing with already existing meanings provided by nature. That meaning was first and foremost generated and is still being generated through our communication processes. So the answer to the question, what is communication, from this point of view, is that it's a creative process, a meaning-generating process. Man, we've already covered a lot of ground by looking at these three models, but let's finally touch on some major areas that show how people look at communication that will help us to make it even more concrete. The most historic area is rhetoric. If you've ever taken a public speaking class, then you have an idea about what this is. It all began when Aristotle wrote a book about 2,000 years ago, and even really before that. And he taught us that when we spoke, we had these available approaches and choices and techniques that we could use to persuade our listeners. The classic view of rhetoric is all about how a speaker can create and share messages artfully with an audience for maximum persuasiveness. Aristotle showed us that there are dozens or maybe even hundreds of small choices that we make along the way that can make us more or less persuasive given the circumstances. Today, the area of rhetoric studies things like political speeches, argumentation, the freedom of expression in society, and lots of other topics like that. 
Another popular area is called interpersonal communication. This area looks at one-on-one -on -one conversations and relationships and normally focuses on face-to-face -face interaction, like friendships, romantic relationships, and family dynamics. At a basic level, you might study things like active listening skills, conflict resolution, the stages of relationship development. The area of interpersonal communication is a big area of study that looks at both nonverbal and verbal dynamics and how small changes in the way we talk to each other can shape our relationships in big ways. Another popular area is organizational communication. and This is another broad area. Here you'd learn about communication that happens in and around the workplace. You might study, for example, different leadership styles and how you see those at work or workplace culture and how it shapes our lives as employees and how communication is likely to happen through both formal and informal networks. Organizational communication is a huge area and we even see sub fields within it taking shape on their own like crisis communication, training and development, and whole classes in professional communication skills. More recently, we see a lot of interest in the area of health communication. And here you'd learn about how communication in healthcare settings is really important because it can directly impact issues like how quickly patients recover, how we communicate risk, and how patients and families talk about illness in either helpful or harmful ways. It's all about the way the quality of communication influences our health and well being. And I'm just scratching the surface. Communication is a huge field and there's lots of other interesting areas of study and it seems like the boundaries continue to expand every day. And like I said from the beginning, finding one agreed upon definition of communication is not really the goal, but we have to at least explore a basic definition, look at these three common models and mention some of the major areas of study to help us answer the question. Hopefully this will paint a well-rounded picture that answers the question, what is communication? So question for you, how would you answer this question? I would love to hear your comments in that section below the video and I look forward to reading your point of view. And by the way, I have a free online mini course in the five essential communication skills that every professional should know. I will put a link to that in the description below this video. Feel free to take a look, it's free. Thanks, God bless, and I'll see you in the next video.